We are recording the interview of Lear Cumberfelt. This interview is being recorded, conducted by Erica Carter and Katie Bradshaw from the Wright State University Veterans for Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at the Veteran and Military Center in Wright State University. It is 1.35 p.m. on October 13, 2019. How are you today? Great, how are you? I'm good! <laughs> I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> oh, we're going to bring that up early, huh? Big, big. <laughs> okay. Um, where and when were you born? I was born 19 October 1968. Okay. Uh, and my father was in the military, so I was born at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington, which is next to Spokane, Washington. What branch? Air Force. Mm-hmm. Um, so you told us what your dad did and who he was. What was your mom's name and what did she do for a living? My mom was Mary Alice Moore to begin with. And next she was Mary Alice Kummerfeld. And she was mainly a homemaker, but did lots of volunteering through um, on the base and agencies that she could get through. Red Cross I bump, jumps out at mine. It's mainly the Red Cross. But a, a huge family supporter, and my dad was TDY a lot, so she held the fort down. Why was your dad TDY a lot? What was his job? His job was a survival evasion and rescue instructor. And he joined the military from San Diego, but he's originally from South Africa, and saw a National Geographic magazine from ages ago and this, that had an article on the SEER instructors and said, that's what I wanted to be. So he hitchhiked across South Africa, Australia, and uh, ended up in San Diego and um, stayed with a family friend there and joined the military and to see the world, which he'd already seen, but, and I uh, became a survival instructor. And he ended up um, going many places, but uh, chief, chief master sergeant of the survival instructor career field. And uh, his last assignment was the Air Force Academy and teaching the cadets. And where's the Air Force Academy? In Colorado. Let me make sure I got this straight. You're half South African? No. He was born in South Africa. No, he was born in Albany, New York. Okay. Because they were on vacation and Grandma went into labor early, something like that. But they grew up in South Africa. So, so you're, that's what he calls home. So your grandma's from South Africa? No. I'm, you're not being helpful. <laughs> She, I, there's more to the story. I want to hear she, it. I'm she's, interested. She's British and ended up in South Africa with the Grumman, Grumman Company planes. And that's where she met her husband. And they ended up in South Africa. That part, I don't know, but they ran a small liquor store. And uh, yeah. Okay. And that's where they had their family. I have. Yeah. Have you ever been there? I haven't, but I have scheduled to go next year. My dad conducts photographic safaris. He coordinates people stateside. In turn with someone over in South Africa, he coordinates the trips. And uh, my son's been, and my turn is next year how, for 18 days. How exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Please be careful. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. So, um, did you have any siblings? I have a brother. He went into the Navy. He's about six years younger than me. He went into the Navy and did the Navy for six, eight years, not quite sure. And um, he's out now. He was a CB and he's out now um, driving big trucks down in Arizona. Well, he's quite the rebel, huh? Yes. Doing the Navy. Yes. All right. He was like, I'll show you, Dad. I'm going to take this over here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, what were you doing before you entered the service? High school. High school. So when did you know that you wanted to be in the military? Um, senior year of high school. Why? <laughs> Why? Um, I, I could say it's all noble and I wanted to defend my country, which is is purely part of the reason, but at the time I didn't have a plan and I knew the Air Force had taken care of my family from the get-go. So uh, joining the Air Force was a good valid step for me because I didn't have a plan and I knew I didn't want to go to school and you know, at least for four years it would take care of me and take me somewhere and maybe show me a trade and maybe get out. 
Well, no, it was probably Get Out. But 24 years later. <laughs> 24 years. That's a long career. Mm -hmm. Any regrets? Um, I don't think you could say that because you wouldn't be where you're at today without everything that happened to you on the way. If you changed something, that would obviously change your path. But um, there would probably be some things I would do a little different, you know, be stronger in some areas and focus on some things. But no, I mean, I, I, I would probably miss out on having my kids and that would be terrible because they're my biggest, I'm their biggest fan and they're my biggest fan, so. Yeah, they're mm. pretty nice. Yeah. I met one of them. Okay. Um, so were you, did you have any hobbies or um, things that you did or were interested in, track, speech and debate in high school, anything like that you, you did? I was terribly, terribly, terribly shy. So what club did I join? Debate. <laughs> and it was not debate, uh, forensics, which is quoting uh, poems and speeches. And if you wanted to do debate, you could, but I knew I couldn't do that. But no, I did forensics and um, was the team manager for volleyball. Yes, I should have played, but no, again, we go back to that shy side. Couldn't do it. But no, forensics, it was fun. But it gave me a different crowd of people to hang out with, so. Okay. Did you move a lot, or were you guys stationed in the same place, mostly? Um, Sierra at the time was a very, very, very small career field. So we started, my mom and dad met while he was in training there, because the Sierra training is at Fairchild. So they met there. Um, from there, we went to Ileson. Ileson back to Washington. I think he had a short stint in the Philippines. Um, he, did, he did some time in Florida, but again, they were mostly TDYs. We bounced back and forth between Ileson and Alaska a couple times. And then uh, he was chosen for the job in Colorado. So we did travel to see family in Australia and Australia. But job-wise, it was fairly small. Okay. Um, so you joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Why not any other branch? Just because of the family's experience with the Air Force. Not, a, not like as a kid you know everything your father or your mother goes through, but what I saw was comfortable and doable. And, you know, either way they took care of your families. And, and the, the other forces could have done that, but I don't, I don't think I ever really even looked at another Force. Sorry. But we just came with the family. Okay. Um, you were enlisted. Mm -hmm. Was your dad enlisted too? Yes. And was becoming an officer ever an option for you in your mind? Mm -mm. Why not? That's a hard question. I don't know. Probably having to go through more schooling had a lot to do with it, but being enlisted, you have to go through schooling, so I don't know. I don't know. Um, now, rumor has it <clears throat> that, <laughs> that being in the Air Force, getting rank as an enlisted person is more difficult, or just getting rank in the Air Force is difficult overall. Um, would you agree with that statement? Was it difficult for you? It was really hard for me because I wasn't a good student in school. So all the all the promotions to ranks, you have to take a test and you have to be, you know, good with your brain and, and study and retain it. And I, a lot of people will say, you know, they're not stud not good studiers or they're not good test takers, and and it might be a crutch. But it was just it was just it was hard. They they always say that you know the Air Force will give you four answers and it looks like two of them are obviously wrong, and then the two that are left are really close, and you gotta pick the better one, you know? So, it, it, was, it was hard for me. For some, you know, the, the, the book people and the people that are able to retain, um, you know, do well. But I think they figured out how to study early on, and they knew how they retain things, and I don't think we do good enough in that, in the school systems, or even in the military systems, and we don't teach people how to study, and and we don't teach people how to take physical fitness tests, not to pass them, but just 
teach you how to run or teach you how to do good physical fit or teach you how to study, you know, how your brain works. I just got by. Me too. Yeah. But I was very, very, very fortunate for um, tech sergeants to have a, a good group around me and they decided that I was worthy of a step promotion, which is just basically walking in one day and giving me the strike and the the next day. So that was, that was fun. Okay, cool. So let's talk about, I'm just, I'm going to join the Air Force okay. and you leave home and you go where? Um, so the MEP station was in Denver from Colorado Springs. And we rode up there on a bus, we spent the night, we did all the processing, and oh no, that was actually the, they used to have a program called delayed, delayed entry. And you go up on a weekend and you do all your processing, and, and that weekend was the day that the Challenger exploded in the sky. And all of us kind of sat around going, hmm, that's interesting. And then so back, so that was like January, and then the next June I actually joined um, left Power Springs, went to Denver, did the oath, got on a plane, went to Lackland, and spent the next six weeks there in the hot, hot sun. Was it something you enjoyed, didn't enjoy, was very easy? Mm -mm. I enjoyed being around the, the other people in the unit and the, that, but the physical fitness part of it, not so much. No? It's the Air Force, though. It is. It's part of it. I, I wrapped my hands around as much as I could, but but uh, it just it, physical fitness has never been a, a part of me. Joining the Air Force now, yeah, it better be a part of you. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, don't take this as the gospel truth. But I mean, rumor was you could you know run your laps with your cup of coffee while smoking a cigarette, you know, and still pass. So. I'd like to see somebody do that. that can't do it now. <laughs> <laughs> can't do like it'd it be now. on one of those Garmor Powell shows or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Just somebody <laughs> running with it. Hey. Hey. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, is there any particular drill instructor or memory that you have from basic training besides the heat? I, I mean, I can see him big. Just big, huge guy, and uh, and you could. This is gonna sound terrible, but you could. His teeth were pearly white. He was African American, and they just stood out like they'd just been cleaned that day. And he was just he was a big guy. And but you know, the day of graduation, he was like, "Good job." And you're like, "Who are you?" You know. <laughs> but no, it was, you know. I guess growing up in the military, you, you absorb a lot of, you know, what your father's been through or your parent has been through. And I don't want to say a lot of it was familiar, but it was structure and I had structure already. So it was, it was tough to see some of the others struggle because they hadn't been through structure and they fought it quite a bit. So you just try to help out what we can. So it was already, so it wasn't a hard transition for you at all? I don't think so. I, I understand. I had a very big, big drill sergeant myself. I yeah. was always just like, oh my goodness, he's going to rip me in half. He's yeah. going to pick me up, right. twist me, and I'm going to fall apart. Yep. I just, yep. What did I do wrong? Yeah. I don't know. I used to hide from him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Vivid, vivid memories. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to Google him one day. <laughs> I am. Okay. Where did you go after that? Um, from Lackland, we left there to go, those of us that were in the personnel crew field, went to Keesler. That was where, Keesler, Mississippi, where the uh, personnel is went for training. And that was a little funner because you, know, you got a lot less structure. But it was also equally as hard for some of those that were like, mm, now the doors are open, I'm going to do this. So... And a lot of people drank, and I never drank before, so it was just an inst interesting process. But it was fun to have your own room and do your own thing. And, but getting up at the butt crack of dawn to march to class, that wasn't fun. Part of the process. Um, 
Did you pick your job or did someone pick it for you? No, I picked my job because my dad was in the military. He said, um, when that day comes, when you're with your recruiter and it's time to pick a job, just let me go with you and, and help you through that process. He, it's a valid career field and an admiral career field, but he just didn't want to see me as a cop. Was that an option? They were just gonna make you be a cop? Oh, yeah. They, they needed those? They, they always, they always need those. Always, always. There's always openings for cops. Hmm. It's just a big turnover. It's just, I, knowing what I know now, it's a, it's a shift thing. I mean, you work in shift hours and that's hard. You know, the Air Force promised you school, or the military's promised you school, but on your shift work, how do you get your schoolwork in there? And then, they, you know, they promise you that you can have your family and, you know, they always talk about this whole person concept. And when you're a shift worker, that's just, that's really hard to manage. And so uh, there's a lot of transition from those first four to six years on the security forces career field. They just can't do what they want to do. Let's be clear. The Air Force talks about a whole person. Yes, the Air Force talks about a whole person, yes. Okay, because yes. I've never heard that before. No? Really? No. Oh, interesting. No. Huh. no, the Air Force is huge on whole person concept. The fitness, the mentality, the spirituality, the, um, you know, knowing your job, having the family. Um, that's, that's huge. And that's, it's part of your, it's part of your feedback session to how much of that whole person concept are you fulfilling? And I think that's a hard person, a hard thing to judge a person on in the Air Force now that I know. Um, because you can't have that all at once. You just, there's, there's no way to be able to fill those pieces of pie and be equally supportive of them all, all at once. I mean, you kind of, kind of, kind of got to pick and choose. Okay, you know fitness is important, you know your job's important, so if you at least focus on those and then, okay, this month I'm gonna try and do this better, and this month I'm gonna try and volunteer some more. And it's just, it's, it's hard to plug all the holes. It's like trying to be a great mom, a great wife, and a... And carry a career field. And yeah, and, and be great at work. Mm -hmm. You can do, you can be great at at least two, but mm -hmm. something's gonna give. Mm -hmm. Or you're gonna drop dead. I mean, you have options. Yeah. 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 There, there are options. We yeah. don't deny the options. Okay. Whole person concept. Mm -hmm. All right. So, how long was uh, personnel training? Eight weeks, I think. Eight weeks. No, I think it's eight weeks now. It's it was six weeks. So you're at about three months of training at this mm -hmm. point. Yep. My basic was three months. <laughs> <laughs> good times good yeah. times okay um so after after that uh, well, no, 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 wait tell me about what you learned to do for your job what is your job what was your job make sure you could type fast enough okay <laughs> at the time old typewriters um customer service skills just what resources were at your hands for the job, um, what the whole aspect of your job was, um, anywhere from issuing ID cards to helping someone retrain, to helping someone re-enlist, to uh, moving someone to their next base, sending someone TDY, um, maybe processing a casualty, um, interviewing someone for their records to make sure the records are clean, processing photos at the time. So a personnel, um, in the Army, I'm a 63 Whiskey Hotel 8, right? Mm -hmm. those, are, those are kind of antiquated numbers now. Right. But do you guys have numbers? We do. Uh, we were 732s at the time, and they transitioned to numerous other things. But So a 732 then, that was just administration and you could be moved into any position anywhere to handle administration so you could go work at the morgue you could go work at the id card station you could go work so I've there is an admin career field they're 702s um, and they are more um, administrative i mean you could say mine's administrative too but we were more job specific admins you know, do anything to deal with 
typewriters assisting, you know, the boss that they're in charge of at the time. I, I don't really know how to make a, a fine break for it, but we were more very task oriented, whether it was reenlisting or PCSing someone or retraining someone, something like like that. Um, we could go to any what's what was called the CBPO at the time. That was the big HR center. Okay. We could do that and do any of those jobs within that. Um, and when I say process a casualty, we were responsible for um, notifying the headquarters and collecting in information that would help whoever's going to notify the family of, of the deceased. We didn't deal with the body at the time. Now the AFSCs have changed so much, the jobs have changed so much that we are integrated with services and it is possible for them to be over in the services area and, and deal with some of those things. But back then it wasn't. We were just part of the, the paper. Okay, so... And getting notification out. So your number was like, I'm HR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's... That's a better way to put it. Yeah. That's, that's more... Yeah. Correct. Hiring and firing and the movement, you know, kind of things. All yeah. right. So I, I, I'm an HR admin or specialist or logistics yeah. or of papers. Yeah. Okay. I can relate. I've done okay. that before. <laughs> All right. So six weeks of that. Um, how old are you? Now? No, then. Oh. Um, I was 17 because when I got to the first base a couple weeks later, my birth it was my birthday and I was 18. How proud were your parents? Hopefully very proud. <laughs> yeah. No, they were proud because in between tech school and going to the first base, I think I went home for a couple days. And no, it was good. It was good. Aww. Yeah. yeah. Aww. Okay. Um, then you get to your first duty station. Is that a shock for you? Or is it still just, Daddy did this? No, that was a huge shock because now, shock, because now it's, at, before it was all on me. I was doing all the, you know, the training and stuff. But now it's, okay, I'm 50 million miles away in a foreign country and I can drink now and. Legally? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and I have to go to work and yeah, it was, it was, it was different, you know, where I was still in tech school, you know, people are marching you elsewhere and you still had structure, you know, now it's, oh, you need to be work at 7.30 in the morning or, you know, and, and you need to do this. And if that's not done, you're staying or so you either embraced it or you didn't. And I say I didn't for a little while, but it came around. Where was this? Han Air Base, Germany. It's closed now. They closed it because you left? Yeah. Mm. Couldn't handle it without you. I understand. <laughs> I understand. No, it closed a, maybe five years later. And they, it, it's funny, the, the unit naming that they had out there, the 50th Space Wing, I actually worked in that again at Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado. They had taken the enumeration from that unit and put it out in Colorado. So I had worked it twice. So it was kind of cool. Okay. Made filling out the paperwork easier. Yes. <laughs> easier to remember. <laughs> okay, how long were you there? Um, Han, I was there two years. Two, two and a little bit. And every two years you move in the Air Force? Mm, no. The first one was two years. The next one was five. The next one was three. The next one was six, and then I wrote out the last year. Do so. you know um, anybody from your first duty station still? Oh, yes. Did yep. you continually run into these people or no? Um, I still converse with one of them today because, um, so when I was in processing, we, all of us sat around a long table like this, and the walls with the, in, the door entries were behind us, and they would come in and they would go to the blackboard there. And... Nobody had come in yet, so we're all sitting around and we have our packages and we're all nervous. And, and someone comes in and puts their hand on my shoulder and, and it's a male voice and he says, ah, oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I turn around and it's a gentleman now um, who lived next door to us while we were stationed, while my dad was stationed at uh, Fairchild. Him, his sister and I played Barbie dolls all the time. And he was the older brother. And uh, 
yeah, it was so funny, and we still we still talk today. It was so funny to see him. But yes, I I mean I I met my ex husband there, um, and there's uh, tons of people I still send holiday cards to. No, it was a good time. It was a good time. Was he able to show you around places and oh. stuff? So it was really great to see a familiar, friendly yes. face. Yes, yes. So comforting. Yeah, yeah. It was good to have, you know, family. Yeah, it was nice. And then he was best friend with my ex, so we just all, it was just all. That's becoming your ex, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so tell me about some things you do in Germany. Oh my gosh. What didn't you do? We went skiing. We did the Volks marches, which are just long hikes in the countryside. Um, we traveled, probably not traveled enough, um, but traveled every place we could get on a bus to go to or a train. Um, it's just just good parties, good barbecues with people at work and. Um, terrible, terrible exercises, and um, I had a major car accident over there that killed me, but I'm, but I'm here today. Um, what else did we do? What didn't we do? We barbecues in the park, helped each other out, fixed cars, you know, just, yeah, it was a good time. Met, met some really good people. So it's late 80s? Um, yes, 88, 89, first part of 89, and, and we head to uh, Peterson Air Force Base. It was safe then? You felt like it was safe to yeah. go about Germany with no problem yeah. and, mm -hmm. and all of that? Okay, mm -hmm. that's nice. Yes, it was very nice. And the mark, the German mark was very good, so it was easy to go to the festivals and just have a blast and eat and shop and that was that was one of the better things about Germany and Holland and and those places is that the shopping was just fantastic crystals and just the wine festivals and when I went to Korea I was broke every paycheck yeah just every yeah. paycheck sending stuff home yeah. and oh it was, yeah. it was amazing yeah um can you tell me more about the car accident I boyfriend at the time uh, we had moved off base and I wanted a cat had cats all my life needed a cat in the house just and so I had found someone who had their cat had just had a litter of Siamese cats and um, they were baby babies and I went to go get one no that's not the right cat anyway picked up a cat. Um, the last thing I remember is pulling up to the intersection and looking in the back and I didn't know anything about cat carriers and the cat was in the back and looked to, to cross the road and got ready to turn onto the Autobahn, which is a fast running road. And um, there was a, a hill in the road. So just as I turned the car, the other car, which was also an American family, um, crested the road and came down and, and hit me in my door and they airlifted me to a German hospital. And from what I'm told, the first doctor looked at me in the emergency room and said, mm -mm, shoot, you know, not worth the effort, whatever was said, and uh, pushed me off in the corner or just, you know, didn't do anything. And start, they, they started filling out the paperwork to say that I was deceased and uh, something happened. Another walk, doctor walked by and they made an effort and I woke up in a, I don't know what they're called, but it was some sort of fog tent because my lungs had collapsed and they needed to get moisture back in, the, in me. And, uh, and I can remember hearing what seemed like an older lady just hacking up a lung, but that's what I remember is a foggy tent and someone hacking, <laughs> which in my head at the time I, I thought was the people that I'd had the accident with. And, and uh, so when they, I woke up and said something like, you know, what's, what's the coughing or whatever? Oh, that, that person passed away. Where am I? <laughs> but um, I wasn't supposed to have kids. I have three. <laughs> how, how did the Air Force handle your injuries and the accident? And all oh, that? I think 
from what I knew at the time very well. Um, it was kind of awkward for my uh, boyfriend at the time because he got to call my parents and my parents, we hadn't even talked about um, him yet. So he was the one that kind of called my parents and kept them updated on what was going on. But um, another good friend of ours was the one to fill out the, the casualty paperwork and send it back. And, and it casually covers everything from being ill to dead. So it's not just, but uh, yeah, it was interesting, but I think the Air Force did fine. They, I stayed in the German hospital for two weeks, I think. And then I was in the, the, hospital, the small hospital there at Hahn for a certain amount of time. And then I was on convalescent. And uh, I think they did fine. Yeah. Was the cat okay? So that's a funny story. Uh, so when my boyfriend and, and our friends went to go check out the car and get personal items out of it, there was a car, car, cat running around the car, just, just in that car. And uh, so he thought it was the one that I had gone to get. And uh, when I later came home from all the hospital stays, there's this cat in the house and uh, that's not the cat. <laughs> it wasn't the cat. <laughs> Okay, she must belong here because she was in my car, so. <laughs> so that was funny. Okay. Okay. Um, so you had a boyfriend and didn't tell daddy? Not yet. It was fairly quick. But you moved in with him. Yeah. All right, we're young. Okay, yeah. We're impulsive. This isn't all about that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Listeners want to know about you. Okay. All right, so. Uh, Where'd you go next for five years? Uh, Peterson Air Force Base. We were both fortunate enough to get assignments there, which never happens. We, everybody called it a joint fiance assignment. But uh, yeah, he, he got an assignment too. And uh, we ended up getting, getting married and had two kids there and then one at the next assignment. Yeah. You have three kids? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, so tell me about what work was like there, the environment, the... Um, different from overseas, because I think overseas just has a different karma about that. You're just, you're over there and you become a family because you've got nobody else. Whereas when you're stateside, everybody else has got different interests. It's, you know, it's just, it's different. But it, it was good. Again, excellent people. Um, I worked at the base level and my um, husband worked at the headquarters level doing the same job. And um, yep, learned lots of good stuff. Still conversed with some of those people. And uh, yeah, it was good. Favorite person in the military? Mm. I don't know that I could pick one. Everybody has a certain spot, you know, everybody fills a different need at the time. Um, to pick one would be dishonest to all the other great people. Favorite memory? Mm. I guess being step promoted to tech sergeant, that was cool. Well, tell me about that. Um, and we were talking about, you know, testing in the, in the different ranks before it was just so out of the blue. We were at a commander's call out at Shriver Air Force Base. And this is just duty station after the, this is the duty station after two assignments after Peterson. Wow. So really jumping ahead. Yeah, well, you did it. Not me. I did. I was just, okay, go ahead. Tell me about it. Um, I ran a, a group out there called the five, five, six council, which is, E5 and E6 and just ran it to keep us all abreast of what was going on, help each other with um, skills, be able to talk about different things, supervisory stuff, volunteer stuff. And at commander's call, the commander wanted, from what I thought at the time, he just wanted to point me out in the crowd and make sure that everybody knew the group and could participate, join, whatever. And the chief master sergeant at the time said, you know what, 
their attendance is pretty low. I, th I, I think we need to do different, something different for her, you know, to be able to give her the gumption to get this group really growing and growing and going. And uh, he goes, I've got an extra set of stripes here. Let's give these to her. So, yeah, that was fun. And tech sergeant is at E6. Six. Yes, E6. And when did you get your E5? Um, that was at Peterson, the second assignment, yeah. Was it difficult to be a military wife in the military and have babies? Yes and no, yeah, if you have to be honest, because you have to choose. You know, if there's a recall, you got to get up, throw whatever you can on the kids and drop them off at the sitters and go. They don't know what's going on. Um, it, it's hard because you got to share your time and they don't, they don't miss. And, and with any career field, even on the outside with a regular career field, you know, if you're a teacher or fireman, you, you just, you've got to make choices, but it's a little different when the government's, you know, you're on the government's dime and it's, it's, it's hard, but you make, you make it happen. Were you and um, your then spouse able to understand and communicate with each other better because you guys did have the same job? Yeah, it gave us, you shouldn't take work home, but it did give us things to talk about and help each other get through if there was a problem. Supervisory or work style or work ethics, differently. It, it did help. Mm -hmm. And you guys were in different units? Mm -hmm. or? Okay. Yep. Was he ever deployed or went TDY? He did deploy. He deployed in 02 when it kicked off. I think he left in like November and was only supposed to be gone for like six months, but because everything was going on, he ended up staying longer. And uh, so because we're not in a high deployable career field, it was, it was a different experience for the kids. They were all, yeah, they were toddlers. Oh, we didn't have Dallas with them. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was hard. But they had, you know, technology's come a long way when you can talk to them on your phone. They had a phone that had a big screen on it. It was all one piece. And uh, you called the operator, they called the operator, they, you know, they connected you and then um, you could get on the phone and talk to them and you could see them on the screen, but it was all pixelated and it was all like five second delay and, but, you know, the kids got to see them. So that was what it was important. Okay. After Petersburg? Peterson. Peterson. You went to? Montana, Malmstrom, Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana, outside Great Falls. Fantastic town, great base low crime, good people. Is that your favorite place? Mm, probably, probably. Just, it was just a good time for the family. It was a good time for friends. It was a small unit. We did work in the same unit there. Um, I met my best friend who I'm still friends with today. Um, yeah, it was good. And you had your third child? Had the third child there, yeah. Okay. How were your kids adjusting to the moving? Were they fine with it? Um, when they're little, no big deal, but yeah, we moved. Yeah, they, none of them started school until Montana. So, and none of them really built any ties until then just because they were older. And so that was probably our first tough one when we left there, because they were really tight with the daycare and Cassie was tight with friends, so. After that, where'd you go? After that, we did three years there. After that, we went back down to Colorado and I was, I went out to Shriver Air Force Base, which was the old Falcon Air Force Base. And, uh, the spouse at the time, I, th I think he went back to the, yeah, he went back to the headquarters. And uh, Shriver was cool because it was up and coming, it was growing, a growing base and they were still building everything. And it was 
all secret and hush hush. You had to go through eye scanners to get through to the buildings on the other side. And it was always funny that if the if the the uh, room locked you in and you were female, it it was the rumor that it told you was pregnant because you're, the backs of your eyes change when you're pregnant. So that was always funny when you saw someone locked down in there. But no, it was a good base. Um, and it's, it's a totally different, it's a full-fledged, I think before it was actually just an air base. They didn't have any um, service functions out there. We relied on Peterson because it was just a half hour down the road. And, uh, but now it's a fully fledged base and has housing and commissary. It's wild, but it was fun. Your parents still live there? Yes. Yeah. How was it being close to them? Very, very good for me and the kids. Um, probably a little jealous for the, uh, for the grandma on the other side, but we did 10 years here on active duty. So you know, she got the tail end, but no, it was, it was, it was good. They were truly supportive and not the typical kind of parents that just show up on your doorstep and say, Hey, we're here. What's going on? You know, they all, and we just lived like 10 minutes down the road. So it was, it was good. Kids ever run away down there? Who's I'm mad and no. go to grandma's house. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> She's got better cookies. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, they didn't try that one. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, you said you were here for 10 years? Before we retired, yeah. So we got here in... No, oh, maybe less than 10 years. Because we got here in 03 and I retired in 11. So whatever that is. But yeah. Why'd you retire? Um, I was at higher tenure, which is, the, which is the uh, wording for you could be, I could be in as long as that for that rank. And I, did, I wasn't able to pass the next step to be the, the next rank. So 24 years was, was it for Master Sergeant at the time. Mm -hmm. And that was fine. It was good. I, but it's kind of a cop out because it's not you making the choice to get out and do something different. It's still the Air Force making the choice and still that structure thing. So. It was, it was a hard time. That was probably, if, if I, you said best time, I couldn't pick that, but I could pick, you know, the, the, the worst time was, was that two or three year period at the end of the career. It was, it was tough. How old were your children? Or how old was your youngest at that time? Mm -hmm. Well, he hadn't graduated yet. High school. Yeah, he hadn't graduated high school yet. So he was 14 or 15. And was your husband mm -hmm. still in? Uh, he he retired in '09, so he was he was out. I retired in '11, so. How were your kids handling everything? It was. I think it was tough all the way around. For as much as I tried to keep everything the same, I look back now and say, mm, I should have let it been a little bumpier. Maybe they would have been able to process it better instead of trying to maybe cover and hide things, but there was just a lot going on. I was being um, medically reviewed for some issues I had going on. Um, the spouse had moved out. Um, I was hit with a deployment. Um, I thought I was getting ready to retire. Um, and there was something else. I don't know. Did you deploy? I did, but I deployed stateside because at that time in the Air Force, they were deploying people stateside to free up people who were healthy to do the, I say, the real deployments overseas, to free them up to go overseas position-wise. I wasn't medically qualified to deploy overseas, so uh, I did a stateside deployment. They count. They do. So where'd you go and what'd you do? I went back to Keesler and worked a center there that was in charge of collaborating all the people to go to training to deploy overseas. And uh, did that for maybe two months. And then one of the training sites that we were over in Indiana had a couple, pe have a, had a couple support people leave on emergencies and they picked me to go backfill them. I don't know if it was part of their plan or not, but I don't know if they knew or not, but the place where they sent me was only 45 minutes from home, so it worked out in my favor. But Did you go home on weekends or did you go home every day? I didn't go home every day. Um, I um, was fortunate enough, fortunate enough, 
that um, the teams that were there at the time of the Air Force people needed to go back to Wright Pat for things. Buy more fitness gear, take tests, qualifying weapons, just a plethora of things that they should have done before coming. So I would drive the 16 passenger van back home, drop them off at the uh, billeting facility and uh, pick them up the next morning. But I'd spend the night at home or, you know, go visit the kids where they were at. So that was cool. That is cool. Not even yeah. your gas. Nope. nope. Working hard. So I think I chose to go home maybe once or twice, but three times I had to go back on for the Air Force. So that was fun. What are some valuable life lessons that you've learned from your military service? Everything happens for a reason. You might not see it the next day, you might not see it the next month, and it might be eight, nine, ten years down the road, but it happens for a reason. Don't dwell on things. Let them go. Stewing on it doesn't help. Um, hang on to the people that support you, that are good to you. But even that might pass, you know, even that might be just a season. Um, stay tight with your family, because that's who's going to be there for you, even when you leave the service. You, know, you, you think you're brainwashed in the service to think that the, you know, you're, you're it, you're the end-all be-all, but the day that you separate or retire or leave the service, that, that spot's filled with somebody already, so it's, you're, you're, you're replaceable. So stay close to your family. What are three things that you do awesome I think I'm a good organizer. I think I'm a good planner. And I love my kids. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> eh. Eh. <laughs> I think you're a really great friend. Thanks. And that takes work. It, it's sad, not sad to say, but you're right. It does take work. Yeah. Well, when your kids it's comes re really natural to, you know, like 90% yeah. of people. So yeah. I don't know if that counts, but. No, but it's a relationship like anything else. And if you want it to, if you want it to last, you need to invest in it. It makes, when you say that, I hear, call your mom. <laughs> <laughs> You should call your mom. You haven't <laughs> talked to her this week. Call your mom. Okay. Um, throughout your duty stations, have you, uh, how many other people have you con stayed in contact with? How many Christmas cards do you mail out? Okay, never mind. 80? Uh, 80? You know, I used to do that many, and then, like, I just so I dropped it to forty. Like I'm mm -hmm. just just oh, two and, books of stamps. Yes, yeah. I'm 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 mm -hmm. done after two books of stamps. And yeah. then I and then I think I I started rotating year to year. Yeah. Like so, every two years you might get a card. <laughs> now, just because you, you know, people don't respond, they don't. It's no, not like they care. Right. They no. I'm so, I'm silly, so don't don't shoot me for this. But I keep track. Me too. Yeah. Like seventeen got, I sent. If I got one, I put a little. So I put seventeen cent s, and if I received, I put a little r. And um, if for a year or so I don't get something, mm -hmm. I still love you, but yeah. Or if you don't acknowledge it, like, hey, exactly. did you, did you yeah. get that? Yeah. You know, Hallmark yeah. card? Yes. Yeah. Hallmark? Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, just so you, you've kept in contact with quite a few people. I try to because I think it's important. It is. Tell me about any veterans organizations you might be a part of or have been a part of. Um, I don't know that you could call it an organization, but I've tried to have, so our original unit at um, 
Han Air Base twice. I've coordinated reunions for them and me. Um, so here I'm a part of the Miami Valley Outreach, Miami Valley Women's Outreach Collaborative. And it's mainly run by Cheryl Malone. She calls me her right hand. It might be a right pinky, but uh, she is a uh, go-go getter. And she literally would give you the shirt off her back if she could, if you needed it. If, if she didn't have a shirt on, she would find one. She would make one. She would, she's the person that would drive you to Washington, D.C. if you needed to go. So I, I run that with her, and we just love sharing information with other women, stories, help, um, any, anything they need. Just mainly just to share a wealth of knowledge and activities and opportunities for them here in the local area. Church, anything else no, like that? No, I'm an internal believer. I don't, I don't, okay. you know, that's about it. VFW. Right oh, okay. Yeah. Knew it was something else. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute, right. there was a lady that was talking. Uh, yes, I do participate in the VFW out of Huber Heights. It's uh, post 3283. And um, I've been their adjutant for four or five years. And that's just mainly the person. Again, paper pusher, adjutant, keeping track of the records and the files and attendance and things like that. But um, BFWs and legions and, and all those are just, they're going through a hard time because it's just today's youth or today's military, it's just a different world and they can find their entertainment and they don't necessarily enjoy sharing war stories or things like that or listening to war stories. They don't find as much value in it. And to educate them on that, it's just somebody's got to find the right button to push, and we haven't found it yet to get them involved. Or, or and maybe they'll go away and something else will pop up instead. But if you give them a chance, if the numbers are fun and you just need to connect with people and not be too shy, get involved somehow. I'm telling you, it's hard doing my job. You getting, love it. Getting people to tell their stories, though? Really? No, I... I yes. Yeah. Yes, I've is. talked to my bosses a couple times about it, and I don't, I don't have anything to talk about. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to get people to sit down and do an interview. Mm -hmm. But when I do, it's, it is fun. I do, I yeah, do really I enjoy what I do. So what do you do now? You left the military. So I was very, very, very fortunate to be contacted by... My best friend who was at Mon Montana, she was working here as a civilian, a retired veteran um, civilian running a unit here on base, and they were building an HR position. And I was fortunate enough to apply for it and get it. And uh, started there for two years. And then my old bosses contacted me for a job that was opening within their area. Somebody had stepped down and I applied for it and got it. And it's basically doing the same things that I was doing while I was on active duty. So that was one of my other stressors while I was retiring was while I was deployed was finding a job and retiring. And I came back from that deployment, had six days of terminal leave. And then the rest of it was a, a type of leave called permissive TDY where you can do job hunting. And so I had that and then I started the next job People normally take 60 days leave, relax, whatever they do. Nope, I went right to work. It was just the type of brain I had at the time and it was one thing that I could control out of everything that was kind of chaos. It was like, I can get this job. I don't have to learn anything new. <laughs> so, and the job that I have now is the same thing. I just do, I don't just do, but it's evaluations and decorations and it's working for people that I worked while I was on active duty, so. Couldn't ask for much more than that. So you still get to work with airmen and enjoy yourself. Yeah, which is funny. Yeah, yeah still kind of get to participate. And you're a civilian now, so you can mm -hmm. laugh at them and go home on time. Yep, because you have to, because there's no overtime pay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'll see yeah, you tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, 
Do you feel like there's anything we haven't discussed or that should be added to this interview? No, I just feel very fortunate to have come across the people that I have and everybody's taught me something along the way and then fortunate enough to have the family that I had while still being able to have a career, successful career. And uh, it brought me to people like you guys. So besides Cheryl Malone, <laughs> mm -hmm. is there anybody else you want to personally shout out? Too many to list. You don't want anybody to get jealous. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> but it's just, it, it's, it's so many. I mean, there's, again, we can go back to that conversation. There's just so many people along the way that you just, you might not conversate with them, but you know, they did something, they instilled you with something, whether it was good or bad. I mean, you always learn something from both, more the bad than the, the, the good usually. Um, but no, I could go all the way back to, you know, Rosie Munoz uh, at uh, Han Air Base and Jeff Naren, who was, you know, he touched me on the shoulder. And um, I can shout out to my ex, you know, Sean Wright. I mean, we had some good times and I have my kids. Um, No, oh, and then and the people that I work with now, Gary Morris and Mar um, Maurice Labrie, I mean, they've, they were there through the hard times. So that's, yeah. Okay. Erica Carter LaForce. <laughs> I've done nothing, nothing at all. Do mm -hmm. um, you have anything, Katie? No, okay. So. Thank you. What message would you like to leave for future generations that will hear or see this video? Hmm. Um, I would say whether you're in the military or not, you know, find a job. Be a good citizen, be productive. You won't always like everything in life, but it's, it's something that you have to go through. And be respectful. You know, don't automatically make yourself a memory for the bad things. You know, do some, choose, choose to do something right, stick to it. Keep yourself surrounded with good people. Call your mama. Yes, ma'am. And your daddy. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that concludes our interview with Leah Cumberfelt. Thank you for your time today and for your military service. Thank you.